Hello, Mr. Chow. Thank you so much for sure. inviting, yeah. uh, um, agreeing to do the interview. Uh, would you please tell us your name and occupation? Yes. Uh, hi, Xi Hui. Um, my name is Edward, and the Chinese first name is Ying Tei. Last name, of course, T S A O. What do you do? Uh, I'm an architect for about 40 years. Um, where were you born? I was born in Taipei, Taiwan, of course, um, and I was born on 54, so. Yeah. Um, when did you move to Houston? Um, after graduated from uh, college, and uh, uh, I moved to Houston to study on 81, so it's 41 years already, yeah. Um, which school did you go to? I went to uh, University of Houston, uh -huh. Majoring in architecture. They have architecture department. They do. They do. They That's do. amazing. Yeah. yeah. I spent two years in there to get a master, and then uh, start working and you know, raise the kids, and uh, get my license, and uh, start practicing. So you tell me your current, your family. Your, your, oh, I, how many kids do you have? I uh, well, one wife, of one course, wife. <laughs> <laughs> and two kids. One daughter, older one's daughter. And uh, she's uh, she also graduated from U University of Houston. She's a graphic designer on his on her own. And my son Jeffrey, uh, he uh, got a, a PT master degree, and is a physical therapist doctor now, and you know, practice in Houston as well. So. That's great. You're lucky. Both your kids are with you in Houston. Yeah, yeah. I'm very lucky. I mean, they they love Houston where they grow up. So. So tell me a little bit about your um, childhood in Taiwan. What is it like? Uh, my parents moved from uh, China, mainland China, to Taiwan. Uh, I believe it's 1948. Um, after they, you know, retreat to Taiwan, um, and my father was in uh, Air Force of uh, Republic of China under General Zhang Kai Shi. Mm. And um, uh, I was born in Taiwan after my brother and my second sister was also born in Taiwan. My older sister um, was born in Beijing. And uh, we, uh, we had a very, uh, uh, you know, material-wise, back then, it's not so well. However, I have a very good family that my parents love us very well. And... Um, and I have a very, very playful childhood, I, I would say, yeah. Can you tell me what's playful about your childhood? Well, I live in a village that was, um, that is an Air Force base village that we have many kids at our age. So we play together and, and, uh, and. Uh, the neighborhood kids. In the neighborhood kids. And then we went to the same kindergarten and elementary school speak the same language. Uh, of course, I speak a little dialect of Sichuan because the uh, elementary school, a lot of teacher and principal was Sichuan people. Okay? They moved from Sichuan to Taipei. Mm -hmm. So um, life was very simple, even though uh, we don't have too much uh, material or, or toys or anything, but we create a lot of things that on our own and then uh, yeah it's very very I had a very happy life back then. Um, what were some of the values that your parents emphasized in your upbringing? Again? What, what was what was some kind of um, what was the some of the values that your parents emphasized oh. during your upbringing? Well, Did they tell you be honest? Uh, <laughs> Uh, they were busy raising four kids, mm -hmm. so uh, pretty much they uh, leave us to the school mm -hmm. in the neighborhood, and uh, uh, most of the background of the parent live in the village because it's an Air Force base village, mm -hmm. so about the same. But um, I remember my uh, my parents, especially my mother, told me a lot of Chinese history and the family values. And um, 
how they survived during World War II. That's the sad part of their life. However, um, it's very impressive, impressive to me mm -hmm. that um, and make me uh, pretty interesting in Chinese history. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm. You would imagine that's right after the Second World War, right? And for your parents to move from mainland China to right. Taiwan, right. you would imagine that life is kind of tough. I mean, also it's like immigrating to Taiwan. Right. Do you feel what? But you told me you have a wonderful childhood, like. But right. did you feel? Did you feel like it's uh, difficult way, the other way? Anything that's challenging? Not really. Not really. Um, like I say, we live in the village that with the same background. My father worked in the uh, Air Force that he used to be a teacher that uh, during World War II that he uh, joined the Army or joined the Air Force, um, working in the martial law court. And um, uh, no, I don't, I don't feel any, any strange or odd feeling when, when I grow up. Because mm -hmm. even the kindergarten, like I say, the elementary school, that it's a Air Force elementary school. So, um, you know, all the kids' background are the same. Community, you know, one community right, that right, you feel right. so part we, uh, of the good community. Yeah, we have uh, that elementary school is very impressive to me. Uh, all the teachers and the facility, even I feel a little bit better than the uh, normal elementary school in Taipei City. So, uh, of course, we study hard, and uh, even get into the uh, junior high school, I have to pass a very tough exam to get into a good, reputable, I mean, junior high school, which I did. Um, you know, after study, and I, where my father pushed me very hard. I think hardworking. So that's one thing <clears throat> that your parents instill in you that. You have to work hard and to be yeah, successful. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, the family education is that you have to study hard and work, you know, so you can get into a good school and then uh, find a good op occupation mm -hmm. and uh, even, you know, move to United States. That's what their uh, aim to mm -hmm. us is. Yeah. Did you think you were going to come to the United States even then? Yeah, yeah. That um, was your goal that after you graduate from the school, you want to come to the United States? Kind of, kind of, because uh, Xi Hui, as you know, uh, our society back then was very much influenced by the uh, Western culture, especially American culture. And uh, when we grow up, we listen to the uh, American pop song and uh, folk song, and um, we dance. And we uh, study. Disco. Is that disco time? Well, yeah. in college. <laughs> in, back, college. in college. Then. Um, and we study in college, of course, we study some, you know, English books. And uh, that in college, that when I get into architectural major, I think it's better for me to um, move to the United States if I can study further. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I had a dream when I was in college. Yeah. And you want to come to the United States? I want States. to come to the United States. Yeah. And you fulfill that dream now. Not mm -hmm. only that. Kind you're, of, yeah. <laughs> you're here for 40 years, right? Yeah, 41 years. 41 yeah. years, yeah. And um, of course, we have to serve the Army for two years right. back then, uh, right. after college graduation. Right. So, um, yes, all the male has to fulfill their yeah, duties. Yeah, it's pretty tough, but I think I, um, that's my obligation to the country. So, you know, right. I have to. Um, pretty, uh, pretty tough two years. Um, so you don't a, feel any like waste of your time to go to not, the military? Because some not, kids now thinking, yeah. why even go to this? Right, right, they, are, right. they are shorter now, even five right. months, and they don't, they think that's the, yeah, that's yeah. a waste of their time. Right. You know, it's an important time in your 20s, right. and you are spending two years in the army training. But, um, back then, um, I think under the um, political uh, pressure or environment that all the youngsters like us, we uh, we feel kind of honored to serve the country for yeah. two years. Even though um, right after you graduate, you got your major and then you have to waste two years. 
But during the offering time, I was a second lieutenant at the first that I learned how to, the leadership of the soldiers, everything. And, um, and also um, I was moved to a, to a, to a staff member of the, uh, of the, in the army anyway. So I have more free time after office hour. So I study a little bit on my own, mm -hmm. you know, English, history, and uh, even I can study architectural, uh, architecture by myself. So I feel very comfortable mm -hmm. for the two years that I spent in the army, yeah. Mm -hmm. I wanna stop for a second, just wanna make sure we have a good all right, I want to ask you something that's a bit off sidetrack a little bit. Okay. Um, so during those times, the, the relationship between China and Taiwan is this kind of um, yeah stressed. against each other. Yeah. yeah. So you feel that you're honored to do the, to to serve in the um, in the army, but now, I mean, recently it's getting worse. But but now there's really there's no reason that China and, 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 uh, and Taiwan should have that kind of tension, right? right? right. And so that's the young people's feeling, like, well, why are we even doing this? Like the China and, and, and Taiwan, and now people go freely back and forth between China and Taiwan, they even do business with, with China. So why is it still important to, to do, to have this uh, medical, uh, military duty? Well, you're getting into political issue now yeah. or, or, or I mean that's or, uh, why yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, um, of course with my uh, personal background of history of China as well as cultural background I do believe myself that those two countries should be re reunited but um, you know after I left for 41 years so everything changed in Taiwan so I don't know I don't know but now they shorten the uh, the uh, military service to five months and um, based on my military experiences when I served in the army I don't think um, the uh, army or Air Force or Navy has better training nowadays mm -hmm. so you know that's my personal feeling. As to the politics, I cannot say too much. Okay. But that leads to the to the future, I guess. Yeah. Okay. But you think that was a good gap year between after you graduate from the college and before you go into your next stage, that was a gap year. Um, um, those two years actually helped you. It was well, good. not really helped, but you know, uh, as I say, I. I use my spare time to study, even TOEFL, English, mm -hmm. you know, get ready, GRE and uh, everything. But um, in the army, I learned a lot. I read, read a lot of books, mm -hmm. especially uh, about Chinese history and, you know, and cause I'm always interested into that part, yeah. Okay, so you have, you wanted to be an architect since you were in college. Right. Yes, yes. Why architect? What's the passion? Well, back then, I think you know that, that we have to pass a very tough uh, exam to get into college. As to how to choose your major, um, I would say, you know, you can control 50% and leave the other 50% according to your, your grade, everything. Uh, I remember I uh, we have to fill a list of our major that we wish to go to. I remember I put architectural major before the uh, computer science, even though my scores that I can get into uh, computer science major in Dongwu University, but I move my architectural major in front of that so I was assigned to the architecture school that means I'm when I filled up the the list of majors 
that I move most of the architectural major ahead of others. Mm -hmm. So uh, I feel like when I was younger, um, I like architecture. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's why. And luckily I got into the uh, architectural major mm -hmm. of right. Zhongyuan University. Yeah. Right. And now you are uh, responsible in the United States. You, you build so many buildings and, and tell me what, how, where, where is your practice? Well, where, uh, what kind of building? Do my you career design? is like, uh, I spent a few years in an architect's office learning after I got my master's degree. And then you have to study and get ready for the exam or the license exam. So I finally got a license, passed the license exam or all approved of each, every courses in uh, 1986, I believe. And then I, um, I start practicing on my own by doing some small projects, like a small house or a small restaurant, freestanding building and restaurant interior design and everything. And uh, for a certain period of time, I even work as a general contractor mm -hmm. that I design and built for my client until like to 1994 that I have opportunity to work for city of Houston uh, government. So I uh, changed my job to a project manager in the housing departments start from 1994 to 1998. And um, in 1998, I have a very good opportunity to design a big facility that one of my friends that um, wants to purchase a land, a large land. And uh, she asked me, and do I want to create the city and being an architect for her, which I did. Um, this is the biggest project that I ever did in my career. Where is this place? Um, it's in the city of Houston, and uh, it's called Carmark uh, Furniture Wholesale, and uh, become an industrial park, which the land is about 20 acres. And the building I designed, it's about total um, 440,000 square foot, mm -hmm. with a big office area, and the rest of our warehouse. And um, that helped me to uh, quit the city job and then open an office again uh, in 1998. Mm -hmm. And since then, I start taking all kind of uh, commercial projects, including office, warehouse, restaurant, and um, uh, mainly office warehouse, I do a lot. Uh, like this building, in this facility, we designed it, uh, me and my in partner. In Chinatown. Uh, uh, this uh, we call um, corporate plaza mm -hmm. office complex mm -hmm. or office condo that everybody own their own condo mm -hmm. that uh, we designed the two story. I designed my office, designed the two story office building here, uh, which um, I think is very convenient and a very economical design so that a lot of small individual business owner, well, office only, can purchase a unit and then mm -hmm. you know occupy your office forever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so during you've been practicing um, architect the design for 41 years, What's the most exciting uh, event you can remember? Well, event, I don't know. But, or uh, incident, or... Um, um, like I say, I have a good opportunity. I'm lucky enough to design a big facility, and then I do design some other warehouse building that, like that one, uh, won a little award, um, mm -hmm. you know, um, because of the exterior design, everything. Mm -hmm. And... Um, Mm -hmm. um, like this building that we, I designed it and then uh, 
and bought one unit and then uh, I moved my office from Harvin to here. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty excited to, that I finally own my own office. Right. And um, you um, have a space, you are yeah, you're yeah. Your belong right. Here. And then the building yeah. I design, so right. you know, in Chinatown area. Yeah. So it's pretty excited. That's the um, yeah. Yeah. How about any challenging, any something that is difficult during this 41 years? Um, I think the most difficult time, you know, practice not 41 years because I have to spend a few years to prepare for the license exam, mm -hmm. which I finally pass it. Mm -hmm. That is very, uh, it's a memory, memorable moment that I remember, I mm -hmm. finally got the license mm -hmm. that I dream of and, um, mm -hmm. and I'm an architect, licensed architect right. in the United States and uh, so that I can practice on my own. Mm -hmm. That's the, uh, I remember that moment very clear. That That's an exciting moment. Yeah. It's not a challenging moment. Um, the, the exam is pretty tough. That back see. then, you know, we don't have computer to draw or anything. We have to uh, carry a drawing board, mm -hmm. like half of this table, and to a full, full worth mm -hmm. every year, only one time. Mm -hmm. So I spent two years to pass the exam. Mm -hmm. But you have to spend four full days in mm. full worth wow. to take the exam. Of yeah. course, the second time I only have three cores left, but it's pretty tough. Yeah. How do you identify yourself? Do you, how do you identify yourself? Well, <laughs> that's an interesting question. Um, I was very, I was kind of naughty, you know, uh, when I grew up in uh, elementary and junior high school. I was very sporty as well. I played basketball and volleyball very much and uh, representing the school and um, I uh, spent a lot of time in, on the court um, of volleyball, basketball, and I got injured, of course. And um, um, I'm the youngest one in my family. So I assume my sister and brother always spoil me. And, uh, but I, I think I'm pretty independent. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, by you know, by learning in school and, you know, um, and learning from sports. And uh, um, that's why I always want to train my son be a very a sporty man. So he plays soccer for school team for, you know, all the time until college. But um, I have a very, I have different kind of interest. When I study, like I say, you know, we were influenced by the Western culture back then when we grow up. And uh, I play guitar, I sing, um, I listen to American songs, folk song, pop song, Bee Gees, Beatles, Brad, uh, Tom Jones, everybody that we listen to their songs. And uh, that's how we can learn better English as well. Mm -hmm. And um, so I play guitar. Um, I was pretty Western style before I moved to the United States. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, that's why we can learn English and mm -hmm. then merge into this society better than some other, some other uh, immigrants. Mm -hmm. But anyway, um, I'm very family oriented as well. Right. Yeah. Do you identify yourself as Chinese, Taiwanese, um, American, Taiwanese American, Chinese American? Um, does any of this? Yeah. Well, this question is kind of sensitive to to me because uh -huh. um, I always think I'm a Chinese based on my family education mm -hmm. with my uh, Chinese culture and history background. And I, that's how, how I teach my children. Mm -hmm. 
to be. Mm -hmm. And uh, my daughter speak very good Mandarin, mm -hmm. and my son as well, but not as good as her uh, his sister. Um, I study Chinese history a lot when I was in college. Mm -hmm. um, at, at certain time, I even wants to study history as a major mm -hmm. or archaeology mm -hmm. as a major. That's a funny uh, thought, but uh, I was very interested in, I am still is in uh, Chinese culture and uh, Chinese architecture, mm -hmm. Chinese uh, music, and so that we can talk about Chinese opera mm -hmm. later, yeah. So do you identify yourself as Chinese American? Yes. yes. Or Chinese? Oh, a Chinese American, of Chinese course, American. after 41 years. Right. You know, so do you uh, identify yourself Chinese American or Taiwanese American? I consider myself Chinese American. Chinese American. American. Um, yeah, I'm American now. Right. Uh, after forty one years. Right. You know, I I don't think I will be used to the living style in Taiwan or in China. Right. It just except visiting or exactly. touring. Yeah. Yeah. Um when did you start your Chinese opera training? Did well, you start it in Taiwan or did you start it? No, here? not really. I mean, like I say, that I was pretty much westernized before I come to the United States. You know, the music I listen to is American song. Um, very occasionally, those uh, orchestra or, you know, very, not that many mm -hmm. um, that I play guitar, I sing American songs and everything. And uh, after I come to the United States, uh, my parents visited me and uh, they don't have uh, any uh, recreation or anything because they have to stay in the house all the time. So I start renting the Chinese uh, opera uh, video for them to 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 watch mm -hmm. at home. Uh, before that, before that, I remember I was a kid and my father used to take me to uh, Chinese opera performances. Mm -hmm. in a particular Air Force base theater. And uh, I remember all those characters or, or, or scenario, it's in my memory. Mm -hmm. And then when I watched those Chinese opera video with my parents, you know, all those interests came back to me. And then I start remember all the Chinese opera that I watch mm -hmm. with my father when I was a very young kid. And then I start getting more interested into the uh, stories or history of Chinese opera. Uh, that was, I was talking about like 35 years ago. Mm -hmm. And then um, I start renting or get online to watch those video or Chinese opera related story by myself. Again, so uh, that's how I started. Mm -hmm. So you, you, by watching Chinese opera tape, tapes, then you feel you're interested. Right, more but, interesting into it. Yeah, but still, how did you start it to learn? Uh, that's a long story. To the, the Chinese opera club in right, Houston. Right, right, right. Um, singing is another thing, but keep in mind that if you are interested in Chinese opera, you have to have some historical background or history background of Chinese culture so that it will into the uh, Chinese opera. Mm -hmm. um, okay, um, so it's it's very difficult to have Chinese opera club in the United States, as you can imagine. Right. Can you tell us one of the most frustrating experience or challenging situation you had in the past 20 years? Uh, well, <clears throat> the uh, people interested in Chinese opera is getting scarce now. Um, sometimes you feel frustrated when you uh, um, try
try to get more members into our club. Of course, like I mentioned that about 15 years ago, uh, we don't have too many members back then. After the older generation, uh, members has passed away. And uh, we spent a lot of time try to um, get the new immigrants into our clubs. But <clears throat> slowly, recent years, we, have, we get more members. Um, yeah, you, you always feel frustrated if, you are, if your interest is not very popular <laughs> to other people in the community, um, especially when you feel that this cultural activity is very, very uh, important or very interesting. At least we think so. But uh, yeah, that's the main right. part. Do you have one special incident not necessarily. No, just daily, just week by week, you're trying to make this happen. And then... Yeah, we, we uh, Adam and I spend so much time to promote it. Um, we, um, we, we participated in many uh, cultural activities uh, in Houston, in the mainstream. Um, you know, uh, for my part, I have to spend like two or more hours to get myself ready to sing uh, part of an episode, just five minutes. Yeah, that includes makeup. And... Yeah, includes makeup, make the hairs and, you know, the helmets and then the, the, the whole dress. Um, but we still enjoy it. However, you think about it, you spend two and three or almost three hours for five or three minutes performances. And um, not too many people appreciate it. Right. So that makes you frustrated, right. but you know. Uh, and and that's not only true in the United States, but also in China and yeah, Taiwan. Also in right? China and Taiwan. Younger people are um, not yes. interested in this yes. anymore. Um, luckily, I think in China now, uh, it's coming back. Mm. Uh, a lot of youngsters start get into it or start liking it. So that's a good part of it. Mm. And then you know they have so many. Uh, TV programs introducing Chinese opera um, and I heard that they even teach the Chinese opera in uh, junior high or high school yeah mm. a music class mm -hmm. which is good mm. yeah who are your audience when you perform who are your audience um in uh, here yeah that's another frustration part that um, every time we perform on the stage um, we have, of course, we have to make up for a few hours and the backstage, everybody is so busy and everything. And just for two hours, um, performances for four episodes. Mm -hmm. But um, audience wise, we have to spend our own money to invite friends <laughs> and uh, older, mainly older generation Chinese immigrants to watch our performances. Um, some youngsters come, but um, they are all uh, the free tickets and you know friends and mm -hmm. all that. So, so it, you the the opera, the club is it, the, you pay dues. And that's how you can. Keep yeah, going. we pay monthly. I mean, twenty dollars or annually two hundred forty dollars uh -huh. to support our club because we have to rent the uh, space, space to practice, and uh, we have to reserve some money for future performances but every performances we had um, we lost money yeah. you know the budget is very much because we have to hire professional uh, band members mm -hmm. uh, we have to pay them because they are professional mm -hmm. uh, from China and uh, we have to rent the audience uh, the uh, theater mm -hmm. we have to uh, spend a lot of money mm -hmm. and then we had budget every time but we uh, is negative anyway, mm -hmm. the income. So um, that's another frustration. So you mean you have to hire, you have to ask teacher from China, all the way from China to come here to when coach you? When we perform on the stage, uh -huh. uh, not all the way from China, but we, we invite some artists, uh, like violin players from Canada, or uh -huh. when they visit their children here, uh -huh. and that we know they are professional. Right. So we hire them or we pay 
for we compensate them for the for the extra time they yes. they help us to practice in the, on the stage. Yes, yes, yeah, that is really frustrating. That. But when you when you like it, you you pay for it. The noise he made, but you never feel that you will catch him. That particular section of the scene that will make you sing hundreds of times or even thousands of times. I used to perform in the community that just sing one part over and over, over and over. I remember when I got into the club that the older generation friends or the, the members, the first thing they taught me is that for this part of the flower face, go back home and practice 500 times first to try to make your noise or voice more close to the master singing. Mm -hmm. So you just keep on practicing. That's it. Mm -hmm. I mean, every you will never lose the uh, enthusiasm mm -hmm. to learn how he sings, mm -hmm. the master. Mm -hmm. So that keeps us going. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I want to go back to your father's um, um, when you were a child, when your father was in Taiwan. And so going to see, hear uh, a Chinese opera is something that people from mainland China, when they go to Taiwan, right. they get together um, to something that they, they feel that's something they, as a community, they love to do that together, right? Through the Chinese opera. Well, community. not my parents. My, not my father. Not your father. He's he, a listener only. Right. I, I mean, yes. So he likes to go there. All he likes, all the people in Taiwan, who who came from mainland China, right? And they were in that community. They they went to the Chinese right. opera to listen. Right. That's something right. using Chinese opera as a mean to make them feel like that's where the it's a belonging feeling. Like. Uh, right. Right. They, you, I think you were right back then. Um, and then the similar thing in the United States. Now the Chinese opera, because of it, now you have a club, you actually sing, but it, again, you're using Chinese opera as something that you feel as a bond, a, a bond, a belonging, right? Of so each you, other, and mainland then... China to Taiwan, or you, Taiwanese born, come to the United States, right? Chinese opera is still is a, something that bonds you with your other people together, right? I think you're right, but um, the main reason they listen to Chinese opera back then, my father's generation, is that um, back then they don't have too much recreation or so. And the government or the Army, Air Force, Navy always have their own Chinese opera singing group mm -hmm. to perform. To So all the older generation, they went to watch mm -hmm. as a bond to Chinese culture. Mm -hmm. They don't sing. Most of them, they don't sing because those are professional singers. But um, they they like to watch. So that's why my father likes to watch all the episodes. If you ask him one story of that part, they can tell you the whole story mm -hmm. and who sing this part, who sing that part. So it's it's a it's a it's a bond of their generation as well mm -hmm. and then uh, of course nowadays you can tell that in Taiwan or in China that Chinese opera is not a very popular uh, 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 cultural activities mm -hmm. even though Chinese government now try to push it or educate the youngsters into it in Taiwan there is no uh, Chinese opera uh, professional singer not that many there are some but not the group there are some people personal hmm. supporting the uh, Chinese opera by their own funds mm -hmm. that is very good however it's not there's not too many people enjoy that Chinese opera mm -hmm. now but in the United States it's about the same in our Chinese club I remember 10 or 15 years ago you know of some of our older generation passed away and uh, we uh, the we don't have so many members anymore. So uh, me and Adam, our our president, 
we have to start writing articles and put on the Chinese newspaper to encourage people to join us. And uh, after those efforts, finally, you know, we have some people uh, start getting interested into it, mainly it's from mainland China, that they do have some Chinese upper background, even though it's Yang Ban Xi, the new part, new style of Chinese opera, but they have that background, it will be much easier for them to learn traditional Chinese opera that we are seeing mm -hmm. now. So um, luckily that's, you know, we have more members now. So um, what's the background of your members in general? Um, right now they mostly from mainland China, uh, yeah, mostly, mostly. Because immigrants from Taiwan, not they, we don't have too many now, nowadays, mm -hmm. in, in Houston at least, mm -hmm. or in the whole United States. Mm -hmm. In our age, mm -hmm. that we move here to study and you know get degree and start working and stay here, but um, that situation changed to China now. Mm -hmm. Most people move here to study and get degree and start working as scientists, high-tech, IT, um, people and then um, like I say they have some Chinese opera background during the uh, in China while they were in China even though it's it's Yang Ban Xi not the real Chinese traditional opera but uh, the music background is about the same mm -hmm. so they have a better advantage to learn the tradition okay. how do you take um, how do you describe the Asian American community in Houston um, when I came over to Houston, um, there are more um, Chinese from Taiwan, Hong Kong, or overseas in an Asian country. Um, but lately, after for the past twenty years, I believe more immigrants from China. And um, by my spare time, when I was younger, I involved into uh, Chinese community activities a lot. Um, like I was. Uh, executive member of CCC, Chinese Community Center, and um, I uh, also involved into some political activities here in Houston, a uh, Chinese political part um, that uh, I, I, I also educate my children as a Chinese so that you should get involved more into the uh, mainstream activities. So, you know, um, I think um, Chinese community in Houston area, including all the Chinese came over from different Asian region or, or, or countries, is more united nowadays than before. Mm. Yeah. How so? Huh? How so? Why do you say that? Uh, because, um, well, you can tell from the political activities that uh, everybody got involved in the past 20 years. And uh, I do believe that um, by their financial background, by their technical background, educational background, everything together, I think um, it's much better now. Yeah. Was, what, what was it? Was it bad before? It's, it's not better it, now. No, it's not bad before. It's just um, like 30, 40 years ago, mm -hmm. everybody is studying and then struggle for their better life or mm -hmm. better family and everything. Now, um, everybody um, is more stable so that they can spend more time to uh, get into the uh, community activities. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it is in your generation, but the still younger students. Younger so generation as well. They as are well. more, more yeah, political. Yeah, yeah. So or like my children, you know, they are Chinese American mm -hmm. or American Chinese. Um, my daughter is pretty active in the uh, community service as well. And my son, well, my son is younger, but you know, when there is an event or activities, they always, you know, join and help. Mm -hmm. yeah. So what kind of activities, what kind of? Well, for example, like my daughter, she's a Democrat, Democrat, and uh, she got involved into political activities very much. Um, 
she she goes fundraising the, or she goes to she uh, she she goes to fundraising and she goes to uh, election activities mm -hmm. and uh, she got online and then promote it or whatever mm -hmm. uh, that I I don't have control of but right. but they are, they are pretty they are pretty uh, yeah I I say that's a that's a very it's very true for the younger generation yeah my daughter too you yeah. know she's still yeah. only a sophomore but she's very political yeah. But you and I, my, our generation, we 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 were under the martial law, right? Right. I look at a policeman walk the other way. I don't want to be yeah. a part of. I don't want to go there. Well, I'm a little bit different. I uh, got involved into um, Chinese and Taiwan's political activities a lot before when I was younger, like 20 years ago. But what do you now, do? Huh? What do you do? Well, I support a certain political party. I see. In Taiwan. Uh -huh. And then uh, donate money, and then organize the activities here, and to support a certain parties. So, you know, that's my uh, personal uh, personal interest. Right. Do you do it here? Yeah. Do you support yeah. political? The... Yeah, yeah. I I got involved into a lot of political activities twenty years ago. How about here, right now? Uh, yeah, I States? also we also do we also do. What kind of poli political? Well, when I was in, uh, when I was a member of CCC, that was twenty years ago or fifteen years ago. We, uh, you know, July the fourth, we organized the, the people to help to decorate the uh, Bel Air Boulevard mm. with all the American flags and all that. So you know, those that's a small event, but. Uh, we got involved into a lot of mainstream politics activities as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like what uh, you vote and then what specifically do you feel comfortable not really, talking about uh, it? Uh, not really specifically, but uh, but uh, I help the uh, local election, mm -hmm. like Martha Wong, Golden Kwong, and a lot of. Uh, Help Chinese American. Chinese election. American, you help Chinese American right. to, to, to be more well and well known and to be aware. Right, right, right. And then if we can get them, help them to be elected, and then you know our voice will be heard more. Right. Um, um, yeah. Right. Yeah. So you feel like it's recent people, <coughs> recent years, the Asian Americans seem to be more. Um, they they are working together much better to bring up the, the yeah. awareness. Yeah. The visibility of Asian Americans. Sure, sure, yeah. sure. I always believe so, and then that's what I encourage my children to do. Um, like my daughter is helping Ben, uh, Ben Chow, Ben Cho, mm -hmm. to uh, to be elected into the uh, commissioner position mm -hmm. lately, recently. Yeah. yeah, that's great. She's pretty active in the uh, Asian youngsters' political activity or other activities. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Over these years, like, since you're in the United States, do you ever um, encounter any dis dis discrimination? Discrimination? Um, a lot of people ask me that, but uh, I really don't ever feel it. That's great. Even when I work for the uh, city of Houston in the housing department for four year, almost five years, and uh, of course in the department it's all minority. Or majority are minorities, and I don't feel like I've been discriminated. When I quit my job, they even want me to stay there mm -hmm. and then try to promote me. But um, for my personal career, I have to, you know, to be an architect on the uh, private sector, practice, yeah. uh, on my own practice in the private sector. So I, I, I decided to quit. Mm -hmm. But um, I never feel being. Uh, I never feel like being discriminated mm -hmm. and um, no I never okay. excellent yeah, yeah. Well, what's the future for this uh, Houston Chinese alpha car what do you think well you know uh, <clears throat> our member we always have meetings and discuss about it and um, it's not very optimistic the reason is you know all the You know, people doesn't like it anymore, or without promotion, they don't like it. So, um, 
feel frustrated sometimes, but uh, but we will keep on going. Uh, mm -hmm. Like we had a meeting recently, all the board members, that we think after two or three years, no, more than that, we didn't have any uh, public performances anymore. So we are planning because to- Because of the pandemic. Right? Because of the pandemic and also uh, even before the pandemic, um, we are trying to organize either uh, stage performances or qing uh, chang, meaning you know, just sing part, no makeups, everything. Yeah, no makeup. Try to bring up the uh, interest from the community as well. But it takes some time, mm -hmm. especially during this pandemic period, mm -hmm. of course, yeah. Mm -hmm. So right now you just have to wait and see how, yeah, what's, yeah. what's a better way to keep going. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Do you guys hang out? I mean, the members? Yeah, sometimes we have. Do you hang out have, outside of uh, the Chinese Opera Club? Yeah, yeah. Sometimes we have uh, dinner together in persons, in one of the members' house, or um, we drink and we sing karaoke. And uh, <laughs> all the party afterwards, we always sing Chinese opera <laughs> together. Oh. I mean, you know, Adams and other members bring the instruments, and after dinner, we always sing together. That's, I mean, that's your karaoke. Yeah, oh, yeah, okay. yeah. That's our common interest anyway. So that's right. what we did. Yeah, right. all the time. Yeah. Um. Hey, Mr. Charles, thank you again for uh, spending time with us this afternoon. Uh, it's uh, April 28th, three o'clock. Um, so I wanna follow up uh, a couple of questions with you. Sure. Um, the first one is how did you support yourself during your student times at UH? Oh, um, of course, you know, um, as everybody else, we have to work part-time and I was a teaching assistant um, uh -huh. while I was studying the master as a structure uh -huh. course but um, and after that I have to work part-time selling ice cream and uh, doing some drafting for some landscape com company or some architect so okay. quite, yeah. quite busy yeah some selling ice cream that's yeah. interesting yeah, I, I, so I I, I was selling ice cream in Astro Dome while watching all the uh, baseball, football games, because wow. uh, uh, on the on the on the open area um, uh -huh. uh, where they have a game. So Whatever. did you? How do you do it? Is it somebody? You, did you have a stand? Yeah. Did you yeah. just have to show it up, or did you have to no, no, prepare no. your own we ice have cream? A, we, we have a stand, a cart. You have to get a cart and a, an icy from the warehouse and then push it or oh, take elevator of course push to uh, whichever level that you are assigned to and then uh, start selling and um you know at the um, at the halftime or when the when the game stops we are very mm -hmm. busy line up many people uh, you have to keep on scoping <laughs> ice or icing to the customer yeah was that fun? Was it something? Was that fun experience, or well, was it, it an it was interesting? Fun, but um, it was fun. Uh, but uh, well, when you get the money, it was very fun, <laughs> of course. And then it was tired. You know, all the games start from like six till like after we clean up the car and push it back to the warehouse. Uh -huh. uh, got home, it will be about eleven thirty or twelve. So you know, it, but yeah. but that's fine. I mean, you know as long as I can make some money support ourselves and family. Yeah. Right, right. And um, so, but also because of your skill, you can do, uh, you can do some drawing. Yeah, uh, I do. For, I, for I, some... I, I, um, I part-time work for, uh, I remember a landscape or a landscape company and also a patio, um, a patio manufacturer or patio uh, contractor that they do a patio uh, the, uh, in the backyard. Mm -hmm. customer in residential houses mm -hmm. and uh, we have to do all the plans and uh, if they do a pangoda we have to draw the uh, elevation and you know for them and i do work for architect or architect as a mm -hmm. 
part-time drafter, mm -hmm. which I learned some, yeah, mm -hmm. even before I, uh, I uh, got my degree. So mm -hmm. that's good. And so experience, is it, was it, of course, I mean. Yeah, yes, it's great learning experience as well. Right. Um, was there any instant you remember was particularly interesting? It could be sad or happy, any interest? No, 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 I, I was very memorable. happy. No, I was very happy during the uh, studying time. And then uh, before I uh, got my uh, degree, uh, I had my daughter. So I have to support my family, of course, and uh, work harder. And um, mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. I was happy Did near my wife and with my daughter. Right. Did you get your job right away, right after you graduate? Or uh, there's still a period you were? You were kind of, that? kind of. I remember back then it's pretty tough because uh, back in 1983, Houston has a big recession. Uh -huh. uh, lasts about till like 87 or so. But anyway, um, after I graduated, I started calling all the architect's office and we have one year practical training. And then uh, I, I got my degree, uh, graduated officially like in June, but I found a job luckily enough. I work for our architect office um, um, on July, 1983. And um, even though the pay is not very well, but that's my first job. And uh, of course, I work hard and we do a lot of residential uh, back in the North Houston area that is building uh, very um, many houses or subdivision. And um, we work, I work on the houses design or drafting and then uh, clubhouse in the subdivision. And uh, quite interesting, I learned a lot, um, you know, skills of drafting in that company. And um, I worked for that company about like one and a half year, I believe. And then I uh, found another new job in uh, Lake City. Uh, the company is a general contractor. They build commercial uh, pro uh, buildings, which I'm more interested in. Into. And um, I work with uh, the vice president who is a structure engineer. And we work together as a I, well, I'm not licensed then, but as an architect and structural engineer, we work on many projects and commercial, you know, like retail center, daycare building, restaurant. And uh, uh, I'm the only one that do the drawings in the company. And uh, we have to get all the subcontractor to my office and which where I learn a lot from the subcontractor, like the plumber, electrician, air conditioning contractor and uh, I learned a lot that helped my uh, help me to get my license on the uh, I see. mechanical electrical and plumbing and even site site design yeah and yeah that's great um, I, I want to ask do you remember the normalization between China and United States when Nixon went to China and soon after that um, America recognized China? And, and does not did not recognize Taiwan. Were you in Taiwan then? No, no, I, I moved here already. You moved here oh, already? Oh, no, 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 hold on, hold on. No, no, I was in Taiwan. I uh -huh. was in Taiwan in, uh, I think he, it's in- Was it 79? Freshman, freshman or in the high school, I don't remember exactly. Yeah, yeah. But uh, of course, most of the people back then in Taiwan are very uh, upset about that. How did you feel? Were you upset? Not, well, I do, I do. I personally feel like um, Taiwan was betrayed by United States and mm -hmm. given up by United States. But you know, you, you don't have any choice. Then um, you have to live on, life goes on. So um, I think I, I I went through my college and everything and military service and you know um, and passed the TOEFL and everything and then uh, came to mm -hmm. United States. 
Yeah. Did you did you remember there was any activity that the students were doing at the time, or people just didn't do anything? And what uh, demonstration I mean, in those days are not a big. Yeah, place. yeah. I think I remember there was demonstration or protest against uh -huh. the United States when uh, even uh, when I remember the United States government sent a representative to Taiwan to explain it why. Uh, we are protest, or I didn't participate in the protest because I was in school. But um, yeah, it was it was pretty um, upset by most of the people then. But um, mm -hmm. but you know that that just went on. I mean, you mm -hmm. know, and mm -hmm. uh, um, yeah, you still course, couldn't do it. You still couldn't do anything. Not, <laughs> no. Nothing you could. Nothing you can do back then, I think. Uh, but still, um, you you still can't do anything right now either, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, yeah. So, how did you, how do you see this relationship between China and Taiwan? Um, it was kind of tense back then, and uh, I remember when uh, uh, President Jiang Jiang Kai Shi pass away, I was in college. And of course, you know, through the news, you will know that most of the people got very sad and this and that. But um, I think when he passed away, the relation was very tense. Um, military uh, is prepared for, for, for war and everything, but you know, it, just, it, just, it just passed by. Um, I don't think oh. China will will um, will attack Taiwan back then. Until now, I, I don't think so personally. Yeah. Do you think China will attack Taiwan now? Uh, I don't think so. Well, not militarily. I don't think so. But um, that's politics. I shouldn't say too much. But yes. myself, I do believe that. Uh, the problem will be resolved somehow, somehow mm -hmm. peacefully, hopefully. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's that would be the best. <laughs> right. That would be the best. Yeah. Right. Um, how would you describe your relationship with the Mr. Yao, the president with uh, the Chinese Opera Club? You know each other for a long time now, right? Which one? Pardon me. Or uh, Adam Adam Yao. Oh, Adam, Adam. Yao. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You know each other for how many years? Oh, we know each other for almost 30 years. Wow. As a, as a good friend, as a good friend. When I uh, got into my, uh, got in, when I joined the uh, Chinese club, uh, Chinese uh, opera club, I know him. And then we work together on many projects and uh, try to, uh, try to um, attract more people into Chinese opera in the community. And then we, uh, we uh, went to um, some community uh, community organization to promote the Chinese opera together. And um, I remember we even went to a medical center for all the Chinese students and then, um, you know, for a seminar to tell them how attractive or how interesting Chinese opera is. And then uh, we uh, went to Chinese school together. We uh, present the, uh, you know, videos and and even uh, Adam play the uh, Jinghu on the spot and then I sing and, you know, we try so many, so many uh, activity. We did so many activities together. And um, when the Chinese opera is very, um, it's not very, um, well, like 10 years ago or 15 years ago, like I said, um, you know, we, I, me and some other uh, members went to uh, Adam Xiao's house. We uh, sing along together and then he play. Um, yeah, yeah, we're, we're, we're a good friend now. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good working relationship too, all right, in addition right, to being right, good friends, because right. you have a common goal. Right, right. Uh, promoting Chinese opera. Right, yes. right. Yeah. Um, can you tell me again about your role as a Hualien flower face? Can you tell me again? Yeah, well, it's... What, what does Hualien symbolize in the Chinese? Uh, 
Hualien's character or roles in Chinese opera episode usually are the uh, general or very loyal uh, administrator to the emperor and uh, even the emperor himself. It's all very positive roles in Chinese opera. Um, and it represents that very strong or manhood, manly uh, character. So um, even the voice is kind of like a baritone, but high pitched bar bar baritone to attract people, um, to show the uh, manhood of the role. Yeah. Does that describe well to your character? Are you kind of uh, righteous? Well, that's righteous what I always and... want to be. That's what I want to be. <laughs> Since the kids, when I watched those uh, flower face rows on the stage that my mm -hmm. father took me to, and uh, I always, always admire their um, personality and their role. That's why I choose Hualien to sing, to practice. And uh, yeah, I'm, 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 I, I like it very much, Hualien. However, that Hualien, when you prepare the costume and the, and the, Makeups and even the hat on helmets and whatever takes a lot of time to do so. And, uh, you know, you, we have to cover all our hairs and then to extend our face to make it look bigger and then paint it from, we use a white cloth to cover all the hair first and you paint it on the, on the cloth to, to make your face look bigger. That's that's what it needs to be by the role, that it's a very big face. And, who, who taught uh, you to, to, how to paint your face? I don't know. Uh, well, some of the olders in the Chinese opera club uh -huh. that helped me to do so. But um, later on, I learned everything, you know, by myself. Uh, from, by from watching, video, from video. Video, YouTube, and now it's so media is so uh, convenient, and then you can uh, get all the flower face pattern through mm -hmm. the through the uh, media, and then the color and you know the proportion of it, and uh, how to make up your hats and helmets, and how to dress up your robes, everything. So not too many people can help you except yourself when you when you. Are get ready to get on stage. Yeah. 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 Um, so you've been with the Chinese Opera Club for 20 some years or 30 years? Uh, I think at least 25 years. 25 something. years? Yeah. And you have many performances and many rehearsals and, and practice yeah, well, together. Not many. Not many. But if you do it once a year, that must be 25 times. Uh, or or a rehearsal. What I'm asking is, is there any event that's memorable, that is scary or crazy, or just something that was memorable, yeah, well, like you remember, like somebody forgot the line or somebody forgot the, the costume or something to you? Is there anything like that happened? Yeah, well, but um, I remember the first time I got on the stage to perform with the makeups and dress up everything. I was kind of nervous because um, that was only like three or, three or four years when I started learning how to sing. And I sing a part um, that will last about 15 minutes long. And it's That's quite- That's long. That's long. Quite, you have to remember all the, all the, all the uh, how to sing first and then you know, Chinese opera, when you sing, it's like by, by the, by the uh, you're telling a story. So it's not like singing a song, you repeat the songs, uh, but you have to remember all that. And I didn't, my skill back then to sing the uh, flower face is not so well. <laughs> and uh, years later, when I listened to the first time I sang, um, it was kind of uh, very, very amateur. And, uh, you know, I even laugh at myself. But anyway, <laughs> you you improve after you listen to what you said. Um, you know, throughout the years, you try to improve yourself. Um, but I was kind of nervous on the stage. And then, of course, you know, uh, 
seeing Chinese opera, especially uh, Flower Face, that you have to make up all the makeup, the colorful uh, painting is oil based. Mm. So it's pretty, um, pretty sticky. And then the body temperature sometimes will melt it. So you have to be very careful and make a very thick makeup to avoid a melting part. And then with the helmets and everything, and you wrap up your hands and the, the rope. In, inside the rope, you have to wear another vest, which is made by cotton, very thick. The reason for that is that flower face, the robe must look very manly, very strong. So when you wear the rope, you will raise up your shoulders and make your body more thicker. But that was made by cotton, very thick. It's about three quarter of inch thick cotton vest. And then you wear it. And then uh, you wear another uh, long pants. And then you put up on your, uh, you put your rope on up. Under the, under the stage lighting, it's very hot, very, very hot. So every time you perform on the stage, when you get off the stage, all my underwear got so wet inside. Even the cotton vest, it will be it will, it will be wet as well. So it's very tough. It's very tough, especially the lighting on the stage is very powerful and very yeah. hot when when yeah. the lighting focus on you. So pretty tough, but I yeah. still I still enjoy. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Wow. Yes, that's that's uh, uh... That's something you always remember that, right, that, right. that but, um, on the stage, the tension. Honestly, honestly, seeing Chinese opera nowadays is pretty, pretty tough, pretty hard working. And, uh, you know, imagine the ancient time or the, you know, when they, when they sing without air conditioning, without, you know, it's, it's, it's a, it's a tough job. Yeah, I imagine I could imagine that. Yes, yeah, a tough life. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, do you have any advice for people who are interested in bringing the culture, bringing the uh, the bridge between the two cultures? You mean the the culture of China, of China and United States of America? Yeah, anybody, yeah, any yes. any culture? Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, we try our best, and then I remember there's a. International festival annually in, in downtown, in front of the city hall, or in the uh, yeah, in one of the park in downtown, that Chinese Opera uh, Club joined that festival many years. And uh, we have to perform on the stage. They give you, they assign you a very small stage, and then, um, you know, all kinds of people come in and then take picture with us. And, you know, while we had a costume on, I, we, we sure hope that we can uh, introduce at least the Chinese culture, particularly the Chinese opera into the culture, into the American society or culture community. So that's what we're hoping for. If a young person come to you, wants to join the uh, Chinese opera club now, do you have any advice for this young person? Uh, um, What's the best way to do it? Do you have any advice for the young well, people? We, well, the park? we do have young people join us. Like I said, that we do have even kids seeing Chinese opera in our club. Right well, now. Before, before the pandemic, of course. Uh -huh. um, we do have American young, young men, uh, not girls, but young men, American, white and sing Chinese opera in our club uh, a few years ago. But, you know, they come and go, come and go, but we always welcome them and then try to give them some advice, how to sing. Can, okay, advice in singing. Yeah, in, or yeah. encourage them to never give up and just keep on learning from video and this and that, and yeah, just welcome them and then encourage them. 
that's all we can do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But yeah. I think, you know, past three or four years, we don't have so many um, activity and we don't have performances. We don't have any singing uh, concert, but uh, we, we are planning to do so this year. Yes, I year. hope so. Yeah. I hope so. That would be yeah. fantastic. Um, earlier, you were telling me uh, the story about how Mr. Yao pick up some costume from some club. I cannot remember the details. Can you repeat yeah. that again? Well, yeah, the detail is like this. In the Chinese community, there was another Chinese opera club or uh -huh. organization. That was Does it belong funded. to Taiwan or, or China? No, not really, not really belongs to whom, but you know, there are uh, many uh, older generation Chinese mm -hmm. opera lover. They um, organize a club in the uh, Chinese Cultural Center, mm -hmm. which is sponsored by Taiwan's government. Those are the senior citizen in the uh, Chinese Culture Center. That when they found the club, there's a lot, a lot of costume or makeup that donated from some Chinese opera school mm. in Taiwan through the governmental help to that organization. And throughout the years, they keep on accumulating. Of course, they buy some costume by themselves as well. So they keep on accumulating a lot of uh, uh, costume or makeup and store in Chinese culture center. Uh, that's not the uh, Chinese culture center that, that I helped to design years ago. That's another organization sponsored by government, but uh, they store in their warehouse. However, all those elderly pass away like 10 years ago. There's no performance or singing. In other words, that club it does not exist anymore. And uh, throughout the years, me and Adam, and Nancy, another our club member, we know the uh, the people in um, Chinese Culture Center that we keep on work with them, hoping that we can get the costume and all their inventories. Because if you set in the storage, it's gonna be damaged throughout the mm -hmm. years, of course. So that through the negotiation and everything and, um, Adam offered them, them a price to buy them out. And that's an, that started another negotiation. Of course, that's their asset. They don't want to give it free, hoping to raise some fund for their organization. That organization is called Chinese Senior Club or organization or society. And then um, through the president of that society that we know personally that through negotiations and Adam finally pay some money. I don't remember how much, but it's more than $20,000. That's amazing. That's amazing. To, to acquire the whole inset. It's, it's like more than 10 or 15 boxes of uh, costume, everything. And then now belongs to Adam. And he donated to Chinese Opera Club mm -hmm. for future performances. Yeah, so, yeah, that's, that's a lot. That's an amazing <laughs> devotion, amazing. devotion to to this club. Right, but, right. Uh, he's yeah. Uh, he's crazy about Chinese opera. I, like I said, <laughs> yeah, he can do anything to promote it. Yes, yes, and thanks to people like you and Adam that is so devoted to it and so they keep going. Otherwise, you know, it's not easy yeah, to, yeah. to uh, it's not sustainable. Even in Taiwan or China, it's not sustainable yeah. without any help. It's diminishing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's, but, it's, it's need crazy people like you too. <laughs> right. Like, I would, like we always discuss the future about Chinese opera. Um, we feel that the future is not good. However, 
Chinese opera will be a very special type of artistic activity and it will be preserved through some crazy people like us. And even though not too many people like it, but it will be always preserved and then keep on, keep on uh, passing to the gener next generation. Yeah, mm -hmm. hopefully. Yes, yes. That sounds like a happy ending, a yeah. promising, a promising future. Right, right. Well, yeah. we hope at least. Yeah. Do you have anything else you'd like to add? Um, not really, but um, I would just like to, uh, we would just like to hope that uh, there will be more people, especially youngsters, that will join us and then like or interested in into Chinese opera. And uh, it's very fun. My advice to the newcomer or my friend is that you think Chinese opera is very hard to learn, however, it's not. And the second thing is that the episode is very interesting. And then once you learn it, once you watch it, you will like it. And once you learn how to sing and learn the history of Chinese opera, I always kid with my friend, you will, you will be addic addicted <laughs> to it. Addicted because to you will it, never yeah. get away from it once you learn it. But if you don't learn it, of course, it will pass by. Yeah, but that's that's what we're hoping for. Right. Yeah. Okay. Well, to be continued, I might still come back um, to interview you more. But, okay. but thank you so no much for your yeah. time. Yeah. So yeah, that's 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 good for now, and um, we will be in touch. Okay. If you like. Yeah. So although you are in the United States, you are part of this big community, but because of the existence of a Chinese opera club, making you feel like this is something that you feel really home, like this is uh, uh, like part of your home, you, you have a community, and then you still making music together, you feel really like this is yes. well, where I you belong. That. Did I you feel that? that this, yeah, this is where you belong. I don't know. If you, right. if you, if your time, your life, or your your time in the United States without this. Can you imagine that? That's something, something's lacking, right? Well, um, even with all the club at home, I still listen to it. Right, I but what I'm the... saying, I understand, but, but that's because after you join the Chinese Opera Club, you right. become interested. But before Chinese Opera Club, if you were only, you know, like a, most people, they go to work and they yeah. come back to work, come back home, and their their time is always yeah. with Americans, and and you know that well, kind true. of it's a very different kind of true, true. sense. However, like I uh, said last time, that we were very much Americanized or uh, influenced by American culture. Sure. Even before I come to United States, I still have other interests. I sing a pop song, folk song. I watch the uh, singing. I always watch American Got Talent and, um, you know. Sure. Those, um, but Chinese but, opera is, is very special to me. Very right. special to me. Right. Um, when, I, when I got very busy, sometimes I listen what I'm working, what I was, I'm working or was working. And I listen to Chinese opera, different role. Not, not only a uh, flower face, you know, Lao Sun, uh, mm -hmm. meaning the older uh, people, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, Qing Yi, the young lady singing, and mm -hmm. Lao Tai, the older lady singing. You know, I listen to different kind of episode that makes me feel more calm and calm. Right. Well, but this is a cultural, right? This is right. a, a very it's, it's deep a... cultural, very different from the pop songs or something, you know. Right, right, That's right. what the young people, even in Taiwan, they lack of this depth. Yeah, it's, it's more cultural related. Right, you, re, you least, learn something. At that least is... from my background. So, you yeah. know, uh, I like it anyway, yeah. period. So, yes. uh, yeah, that's it. Okay. All right. 
Great. Okay, thank you again for your time. Okay, no um, problem. Okay, and until next time. Okay, all right, anytime. Okay. Um, as long as uh, we're not busy. So okay. yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you. All bye right, bye-bye. Have a nice day. Bye-bye.